Welcome to Knowledge Drop, an engineering-based podcast where we talk about the future, what it brings to us, what it's going to mean for us, and how engineering reflects on our lives. My name's Caden. And I'm Derek. And we welcome you guys. Um, This week, we're going to be talking a little bit about electric planes. And Derek will be hosting. Uh, Sorry, not hosting. He will be teaching me, and I will be humbly listening. Yeah. Yeah. You actually inspired me from um, the last episode about, you know, sonic jets and rockets and future of transportation that I wanted to, I've heard a little bit about electric planes and I wanted to dive into it a little bit better. Yeah, man. It seems like everything is going that way. So the sooner we can accept it, the better, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. The sooner we can embrace it, figure it out. So you want to hit us with a fun fact? I know that we're. uh... Yeah. So um, this week's fun fact is um, called Kessler syndrome. Okay. And I know we did an episode a little while ago about asteroids and um, we talked about um, the international space station and how fast it orbits the earth. Right. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you told me it was 17,500 miles per hour. Yeah. Yeah. So Kessler syndrome talks about how um, there are other objects in space that are orbiting the earth junk that we've left over or junk that we've put there, um, Mm -hmm. you know, old satellites and stuff that is orbiting that if it crashes into something else, it creates this giant debris field that's going thousands of miles per hour so it can all bunch up is that what you're saying like the debris crashes into itself and makes like a a big ball of debris or i it would actually be better if it balled up but the problem is when it hits each other because of physics it's going to hit and ricochet into a thousand different million different pieces because physics yeah (laughs) So it's not going to be able to make it down far enough into the atmosphere to burn up. Is some some will, and eventually, like due to like solar wind and like the the motion of the moon, like the gravity pulling on it and pushing on it and stuff like that, that will eventually deorbit the debris. Yeah. But the problem becomes what happens to the debris that stays there for you know a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. And so let's just say, so if you've ever seen the movie gravity oh yeah give me an anxiety attack yeah i did not like that movie (laughs) (laughs) for multiple reasons but anyway what happens in the movie is a good example of kessler syndrome is when a when so in the movie um russia blows up a satellite yeah and the satellite explodes into thousands of pieces into this just giant cloud of debris in space and it's moving super fast around the earth and eventually that cloud comes and hits another satellite and that ex satellite that satellite goes into a thousand other pieces and sure. it just keeps it making this cloud bigger and bigger and eventually um it starts hitting the space station and other you know larger satellites and um this is kessler syndrome is there was a lot of studies done in the 80s and 90s about this because if it gets to a certain point, these debris particles, like we're talking about like things that like nuts and bolts that break off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause like there is like paint flex and stuff in space, but their, their mass is so small that it wouldn't really make a huge dent or. Yeah. Anything. But if you got a, if you got a nut or a bolt flying through your space station at 17,000 miles an hour, that's a lot of energy. You know, that's that's much more than a bullet, I think. I think bullets travel at like 7,500 miles per hour. Nope, I think I'm wrong. I think it's like 760. I don't think it's 7,000. That seems really fast, actually. Mm. We do our own Googling around here. Yeah, the Google says that <laughs> average muzzle velocity is 1,200 miles per hour. 1,200. All right, I was wrong both times. But it it can go up to 2,800 miles per hour. That's in miles per hour. 
What is the, sorry, since you're on the Google, what's the land speed record for human beings? Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Are you talking about like someone running or just no, the not running. land speed record? Okay. <laughs> I just typed what you said of land speed record for humans and right. it was like the fastest someone has ever ran run before is okay. Wait, the, well, how fast was that? <laughs> since you brought it up. A little, little bit of a tangent, but how we got all says, the time in the world. Oh, it's by Usain Bolt and it of is 27 miles almost per hour. 28 miles per hour well his last name is bolt so yes, it, i'm sure expect? that came in handy it's like a it's like in life when people have names associated with like what they end up doing for work yeah it's kind of weird how that works out like a lot of superheroes <laughs> yeah there's something um, like Dan as a dentist or like just weird stuff like it goes coincides with your name. Like if your dentist friend Dan Moeller. Right. Yeah. You're just destined um, to be a dentist. So the land speed record is twelve one thousand two hundred twenty seven. And so okay. the fastest um that vehicle is called the Thrust SSC. <laughs> okay. If, if you could take that vehicle and a like slow in terms of a low velocity bullet, this uh -huh. vehicle would beat it just barely. Yeah. I would love to be moving in one of those and have a bullet like right outside your windshield. <laughs> just watch it float right by you. That would be cool. Um, not in acceleration, but just in top speed. I just have yeah. to be clear about that. Yeah. I remember uh, that they were like, land speed record and bullets were like neck and neck so maybe that's why i had it confused but gotcha but yeah i think that's pretty cool anyway what were you so, uh... <laughs> um yeah to kind of circle back from our tangent um kessler syndrome it's something that yeah. it's, i've i've kind of thought about just because i'm i don't want to say i'm worried but it's something that i see um, a potential market in for future companies is everyone in the world is trying to figure out how to solve this problem of space debris and mm -hmm. like everyone from like NASA and Europe, they're like, we could use lasers, we could use nets, we could use like air, like just kind of push it away. Yeah. Well, we want to push it into the earth. Um, well, if it's mostly metal, just throw a big old magnet up there. That's and true. The, but the a lot magnet of magnet grabs onto everything. But and a lot of uh, the big... aerospace stuff is aluminum. Oh. And you can't, yeah. it's not uh, not magnetic. Bummer. Yeah. So anyway, I just, I think it's really cool. And I don't know a lot of people that understand that problem of like, sure. kind of, if you put like a piece of glass in space and you hit it with something, it's going to shatter into a million pieces. And those million pieces are now their own bullets or their own projectiles. They're going to go and hit other things. Yeah, so it just keeps creating this huge storm of debris that eventually mm -hmm. can just eat up everything that's out there. Yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully that's not developing too quickly. Well, okay, so <laughs> I wasn't going to go too much into it, but there – let me see if I can find it. There's a specific satellite. Here, I'll just read it. It says the Invis Invisat – Invisat? Mm. I don't know what it is, but anyway, yeah. it's a um, it's an old satellite that is no longer in commissions. So like it's just sitting up there, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every mm -hmm. year, there are two objects that are expected to fly by it within 200 meters. And so, okay. like the likelihood, we don't know exactly the trajectory of those objects. I believe because it says that the chances of it hitting the satellite are higher every year. And so it's like, if it hits this one satellite, it could be catastrophic. Huh? And here, sorry, here's the end of the fun fact. That's not so fun. Fun if, fact of doom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if this Kessler syndrome pans out the way that we've described 
it will stop all space related activities for generations. Dang. Well, yeah. And it's, it's actually a really big deal that we protect our satellites. Yeah. Like it's a really big deal. A lot of things depend on those satellites, not to mention getting around anywhere that you've never said you haven't been to before. I mean, who wants to go back to like physical maps? Ugh. Oh my gosh. I pull out that map and I'm like, why isn't it moving? It's not <laughs> yeah. moving anywhere. I can't see where I am on this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I get mad at Google because they, I don't know, they changed the setup of Google Maps so that the map is always oriented north as yeah. up and south. That's what it should be. Down. That's no, how it should it, be. It used to be the direction of your travel is the road that you're on. So it looks like you were well, driving on the road that you're on. So, so if you saw a turn on your little screen, you knew like I needed to turn. Okay. Left. So if you just press directions, it'll map out in a blue line where you need to go, right? Yeah. And that will just keep north, south the way that it is. But if you press start, like start navigation, mm -hmm. then it will turn into the road view and it will guide you like turn by turn to where but it actually... Looks like you're making the turns and stuff. Okay. I'm going to have to test that because I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've, they've like defaulted to just north is up, south is down, even in the start mode. Well, I'm pretty sure that the start mode, like it's from the perspective of like you're driving on the road, I think. But uh, yeah, I would yeah, check that out. Because yeah, this. I honestly prefer that north, south is always the same. I know nobody cares about this, but <laughs> I taught my wife how to tell north south east west and her life has totally changed now she's like oh my gosh it's like it's on the southwest corner of this road with this road it's like oh wow it's it's actually coming in handy so how did you teach her did you teach her the uh never eat sour well, watermelon no i just i mean just based on where we live like you know those oh, mountains gotcha. yeah those yeah. mountains are always to the east you know, those mountains or Phoenix, it's always to the West. Um, but then there's obviously the sun. So the sun gives you a big old hint as to where th what things are doing, um, mm -hmm. depending on your time of day. And then also Arizona is so amazing because we live on a grid. Like you don't have to be that good. Like I'm not even that good, but North, South, East, West, like everything is on a grid square grid so wherever you are it's generally really easy to find out north south east west yeah it's hard for me to visit other cities that i'm just like driving around taking... la you're like <laughs> yeah i don't even know am i still in la i don't know yeah exactly yes so 15 dollar parking why <laughs> so anyway coming back to you know our our topic for today. Um, so I just kind of want to lay the groundwork for just planes in general. So tell me what you know about planes, traditional planes. Well, the original model was created by the Wright brothers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I heard that somebody was before them uh, just a little bit, I think with model planes, and then they kind of improved upon it. I haven't done enough research. Um, so I need to do more research on it too, but to my understanding there, they had a competitor, but because the Wright brothers patented their flight or their wing design, their mm -hmm. competitor, um, couldn't keep up with them cause he couldn't figure out another wing shape that would work. I mean, that's a pretty good patent to have. You're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I patented the wings. Yes. So good luck. Maybe that guy came up with the helicopter. You know? Yeah, maybe. He's like, no wings? Fine. I'll figure out something. Um, yeah, so the only thing I know about planes, they are really expensive to have and maintain and run. Um, so they're a pretty expensive mode of travel for people buying tickets and also for people who are selling plane tickets. Um, they run on diesel. And I think, right? 
Sorry, gasoline? Dude. No. Jet if, fuel. Different from diesel. Yes, jet fuel is a uh, much more concentrated. I shouldn't say concentrated. It's like if you took premium and you put like Russian steroids on it. Oh, really? It's like a super premium. I don't want to say gasoline. Well, I so that's why it's, it's so kerosene. expensive. Yeah. But um, anyway, I I didn't do that much research into the fuel. Yeah, people say jet fuel and you don't really know what that means. I thought maybe it could be just a fancier way of saying <laughs> something we all know about. But yeah, yeah that makes sense. It would be more concentrated because you're going to need a lot of power to uh, get a thousands and thousands of ton object to fly in the air Mm -hmm. no that's that's one of the points that we're going to talk about later um and so we use do you know why we use gas like we'll just call it jet fuel um do you know why we use this kind of fuel over any other so like a battery for example so like we're talking about electric planes why would we use jet fuel over um, a battery to power the plane it just seems like the amount of power generated that you would need would be so huge for something electric you would need a battery that's just massive Mm -hmm. that's my first thought Um, that's exactly it and the jet fuel i mean like you said it's your premium premium stuff and then it's you know it's that to another level so it's burning at such a combustion like it's it's raging in there, which is creating enough, you know, enough force in the engine to, uh, to generate the, the power necessary. But, but yeah, I would say it's like Tesla electric cars, pretty much the entire bottom of the car is the battery, right? Mm-hmm. Like that battery is big. It's, it's the whole car pretty much. It's the length of the car. Um, I think you would need something way too big to make it really work for a plane. So, I'm interested to hear kind of how does that work for a plane then, you know? And um, trains and bikes and cars like with Tesla. And the reason we've been starting to do more of this electrification is because like kind of what you were saying is the batteries have been such a cornerstone to this technology and we've been improving that technology a lot in, in the last, you know, uh, few decades. Yeah. Yeah, so we must have something that's because as we go forward, technology is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So I would imagine that we're getting more and more efficient with our batteries too, now to the point where we can start plugging them into planes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And so the reason why with any vehicle, it's called like the power to weight ratio. Mm-hmm. with batteries they just weigh so much compared to um, jet fuel or any other kind of fuel that like the the density of energy within the the liquid or within the battery isn't enough to match um, fossil fuels right because if you if you want to move something like a big old plane you're going to need a lot of power kind of like what you were saying um, in the beginning, you're going to need a lot of power, which means you're going to need a lot of batteries. But if you are going to put a lot of batteries, it's going to make the plane heavier, which means you need more power, which means you need <laughs> more batteries. And it's kind of this really bad negative feedback the loop cycle. that you're in. So yeah. unless you improve the battery or the weight of the plane or the efficiency of the motors, you're, you're not going to go anywhere. Yup. Yeah. So how would you, uh, are batteries just getting efficient enough now to where they are light enough and they're generating enough power? Yeah. Um, so like we have been making a lot of strides, like Tesla has been making a lot of strides specifically with battery technology. Um, and that's the reason why they're leading the pack with electric cars because they've been, pushing the envelope and making sure that they have the longest range electric car um, that's available to, you know, regular consumer. Like I think that's up to like 350 miles. Um, I mean, we'll see. Not Um, that much. Elon Musk 
has announced um it's called battery day where they make big announcements about the company uh-huh. um it's going to be in september and um a lot of stuff has been um, talked about and insider information from employees about how there's going to be a new battery um released not released like they're going to talk about the new battery technology that they've um, come up with and that they'll be able to have like a four or 500 mile range vehicle. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's farther Um, than my car on a full tank of gas. Yeah. And the, the other cool thing about these batteries is um, that, I mean, this is all um, rumors, but what they're saying is um, these batteries, because of the, the way that they're being manufactured and the way that they're in their packs in like in the bed of the car or in the bottom of the car. Uh-huh. Um, they'll have a certain amount of cycles. So like from fully charged to fully dead and a charge from dead to full is a, a cycle. Okay. The number of cycles will last you um, 75 years. Oof. Without one, changing the battery. With, yeah. With one week, one charge a week this one battery pack of your vehicle will last 75 years. Jeez, man. And so they're they're If that's true and they confirm it on battery day, they're going to call it the million mile. Um, yeah. Battery. So it's exciting. Cause um, if this is true, then the, the electric car will be cheaper to buy and manufacture than a regular internal combustion car. Does that mean you'll see prices drop? They have already dropped, but yes, I think they'll drop even further um, just because if the batteries are cheaper, Elon Musk does a good job of trying to pass those along or develop another technology within the company. Yeah, I think that, I mean, we've said it before, but Tesla is going to be, I mean, it's going to be like anything else. It's going to be like your Toyota. Like it's going to be that common, you know? Yeah. And And I think hopefully other companies will catch up. So it's not just Tesla's on the road. I mean, I love Tesla and they have by far the best looking cars, Yeah, but it's competition that fuels innovation. Hashtag capitalism. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's right. Um, So yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to bring it back to electric planes. So who's behind, do you know who's behind developing that battery technology or electric so, plane companies? Um, I have a list of companies I, I'll talk about later because the battery problem is only one, is only half the problem. Um, the other half of the problem is with um, certification from air, like uh, the FAA. <clears throat> uh-huh. Like because, a patented design or something? Well, they want to make sure it's safe. Of course. And so like if it's a brand new vehicle, the FAA needs to make sure it's safe in, you know, X, Y, Z conditions. And so it takes years and years and years of testing to certify a a brand new vehicle for production. And, um, and so it's really expensive for, you know, a startup company of electric planes to make a plane, you know, just by itself. Yeah, And then to also go through all the hoops and loops that it has to go through to be certified by the FAA to fly passengers. Yeah, getting it through those hoops and loops is hard to maneuver. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, a, that's too bad. I mean, you really think it takes it so it's years and years of having to test and retest and... Especially with something this new, yeah. Yeah, I mean you are you are talking about, you know, potentially hundreds of people at once on this vehicle. So it's hard I mean, to stray from the, the tried and true. Yeah, so they're right now all of the companies that are trying for electric planes, electric planes don't make sense right now with the battery technology that we have for yeah. anything more than a regional flight. Okay. And so like from, so for us example, from Phoenix to Los Angeles or Phoenix to Salt Lake City or Phoenix to um, Houston, like those are 
um, kind of the limits of what an electric plane could do for like nine people. Yeah. Like that's the most that they've well, been kind of um, doing. Yeah. But it's, it's not there yet, but here's, here's the, the upside. Um, this is something I found on business insider. Mm-hmm. They said, this is a quote in 2018, a little less than half of all air tickets sold globally were flights under 500 miles. Yeah, well. And so electric planes would actually solve a lot of that problem because under, you know, 500 miles, you know, actually, I don't know if that's going to take you from Phoenix to Houston, but or even Los Angeles. I think it's like from Phoenix to, to Las Vegas. Los Angeles? It's about 400 miles, I think. Maybe. 350 yeah, or 400. Anyway, it'd make a, a big dent in the like way to travel if we are going to do this whole electric plane thing. Yeah, if you just... Uh, that way... Well, I don't know. I wonder if it would be cost effective because then that would mean that you have your your bigger passenger airlines not as full if uh what they would have to do is have some sort of exchange where they get rid of some of the larger planes because and now a lot of that load is being taken care of by smaller electric planes right yeah but um those big traditional jet fuel planes actually are most efficient over long distances at high altitudes. <clears throat> okay. And so it's just kind of like a win-win all around is like, yes, there might be fewer people. And the, the way that they could get around that is just offer less flights. Yeah. So like instead of having a giant big um, 747, you know, fill up every, you know, I think there's a flight out of Phoenix to, Los Angeles, like every two hours. Right. Instead of doing every two hours, you could do every six hours on big planes. But then the electric planes are doing the two hour stuff. Right. Because it would equal out because, you know, more frequently you can have those electric planes in and out all the time. Mm -hmm. And probably would be faster for you as a consumer to get on and off of a smaller plane where you're not waiting for. 200 other people to board and sit exactly. down and then go through the procedures, you know, and then offload and everything. That's um, really cool. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to think about. Um, one of the other things that, so a lot of companies that are pursuing electric planes, the way that they're getting around the certification process is to retrofit, retrofit um, older planes with electric motors. And so, so that counts. You yeah. Just do well, that? the structure, the plane itself has already been certified and tested for, you know, potentially decades. Well, it seems like that's what you should be doing. Right. I, I guess I wasn't imagining that they were building a brand new plane from scratch, but, but those, do. those old planes are, are built with jet engines in, in mind you know what i mean like right. the design of those is optimized for this ty- kind of engine and so they're not optimized for an electric powertrain sure if that makes sense yeah it does yeah if you come up with something powered entirely by an electric motor yeah i guess you would need to test out every little thing here and there to make sure that it's 100 percent. you know yeah so that's kind of the underlying discussion of you know, what the electric planes are, how they work and what the limitations are and where we're kind of the issues that we're having currently. Um, So one of the cool things, so I actually watched a documentary on this um, electric plane specifically. It's called the Solar Impulse 2. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you heard of it at all? I have not, no. So the Solar Impulse um, 2, it spent 505 days and flew 26,000 miles and circumnavigated without, the without Earth. landing it did land um it just it it didn't have the 
power to be able to do nonstop, but the longest leg of the journey was from Japan to Hawaii. Uh, how far is that? Because now, in my mind, I always start from where I am and go either east or west. But when you're talking Japan to Hawaii, it's like going all the way around. So I think you're actually fairly close. Man, I'm not good with geography. Um, it's 4,108 miles. Oh, okay. So that's really, really far. <laughs> yes. That's um, not close. And it was it was really cool, I thought, because this project, the Solar Impulse Project, is a privately financed, you know, group of people. But it's um, it was spearheaded by a Swiss engineer and businessman named Andre Borschberg, I think. Borschberger. Yeah, I I hope <laughs> I said that kind of right. You know what? We're always gonna get it wrong because yeah. we're not. <laughs> but anyway this Dude, was man. this was a couple years ago when he was able to complete this flight um and i just it it baffled my mind that you know someone actually did this and was able to build it and it wasn't some you know big company or some you know university it was someone who was like this should be possible well yeah and, i was gonna say screw electric planes i mean that seems pretty good I'm imagining it's like a biplane, right? Like something small. Um, so it actually had a very large wingspan because it had solar panels covering the top of the wings and some of the fuselage. Yeah. And um, those um, solar panels were charging the batteries in the wings and the fuselage. And so that it could run at night. At least for a little bit. It was gliding a lot during the night. So why isn't this do you think this is a better idea or electric planes because i see a lot of potential there honestly i think um there needs to be more of these kinds of things so this solar impulse is it's an electric plane but it's the way that it got energy was different um, than just kind of charging it at an airport is it much slower the average speed not the top speed but the average speed was 45 miles an hour Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's more of a glider than a yes jet plane, yeah. jet engine, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I get. But it it's it's something that someone was able to do, and something well, yeah. that you know yeah. we were able to accomplish, and something that was new, and um, so it's generating new ideas and showing people that this is possible. Right. Um, and so on the flip side, this one was powered by solar. Um, you might have heard about this plane that MIT built two years ago. Um, it has no moving parts, and it uses ions in the air to generate thrust. So no moving parts. It has no combustion engine at all. It has no combustion. It has no um, like electric motors it generates lift from ions passing over the wings. Whoa. Um, so uh, this, wow. it was, this was just a test flight inside of a building, but it, it demonstrated mm -hmm. this concept of being able to generate lift from, uh, you know, the, the air that it's going through. Cause as you move through the air, this plane, <laughs> it's generating, electricity and it's generating these ions and so it's able to take advantage of the attraction of um, different ions to the wing and generate lifts um, they were able to complete a 196 foot flight 10 times meaning that like they were able to repeat their experiments to you know show that their results were good and repeatable so just that i have it clear the motor let's say is being charged by the ions that are passing over the wings, the ions that are in the air, passing over the wings, causing a sharing of electrons, let's say, somewhere, which is getting back to the motor. I mean, um, I don't expect you to know every detail, but that's like 
Whoa. So I was actually, I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like and I'll describe it for our listeners. So you can see it's got these wings, but then it's got multiple levels of these wings so that (laughs) as it goes through the air, these wings are going to hit the air. And then inside of the nose of the plane, there's batteries and there's a power inverter because it's, it has to have like a 40,000 volt um, current pa- or um, it has to have that amount of electricity mm-hmm. passing through it. And so as it's going through these wings, it, I, I, I don't understand it fully, but yeah. from what I understand there's when you're in the air materials that pass through over other materials. So like in physics, when you, rub cotton on a plastic rod it generates um a difference of electric fields yeah they're using that to generate lift so just for anybody who um can't see which is everybody um that plane is it's not a passenger plane by any means it's more it looks more like a wright brothers plane where it's kind of like a I don't know what to say, a prototype right now, right? Yep. Yeah, that's a good way to say it is it's a prototype. Of, it's kind of like Solar Impulse where it's like there's not a lot you can do with it, but it demonstrates a concept that we can further develop. Yeah, I mean, if you had shown that, I mean, that's still incredible because you're saying, look, I'm this is flying and it has no, I mean, it has a drivetrain, but it doesn't have an engine. It's just, it's so trippy to me. So here's a, a video of the flight. So it, it flew 196 feet. And like, it, it's completely silent. Yeah. And yeah, I just, it, this was another thing that I just was wanted to talk about. Cause I'm like, this could be like the science fiction level of <laughs> what, the future of flight could be. It's like when you hear about aliens and people are like, yeah, it came floating right over me, but it made no sound. Um, it's funny because one of the guys, the professors that helped develop this, that was uh, what he was kind of going for. He's, he mentioned Star Trek, but I don't, I don't know Trek, Star Trek very well. You're not a Trekkie? No. I'm not either. Just, <laughs> just saw the movies. I'm, yeah, but, the know. movies are great, but as far as that goes, yeah, not much else. Um, yeah, we're just a little bit too young to be into that. Yeah, but uh, no, but that's really cool because you can imagine it like I'm imagining it like on a larger scale, this huge plane just floating in, but it makes no sound at all. Yeah, they said that the next step for this um, prototype is to make it more efficient. So, like, the batteries on board have to be smaller and more energy has to be packed into them and the wingspan has to come down. Um, They said that it might be able to be a good drone replacement. So, like, you know how flying saucers are? Just imagine that instead of a noisy drone. Yeah. Yeah, that makes... And I'll I'll make sure and put this... um, article in the show notes so if you guys want to um, read more about it or see the video of it flying you can yeah you guys should check that out it's, it's mit so put that in the show notes but yeah that's that's a really cool idea i'm i'm loving these alternative ideas you know it's just showing me that we're so far from being I don't know. A lot of people paint a picture of like doom and gloom these days. And I think that the reason for that is because panic sells well. Like it gets you, clicks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you can say the world is ending in 50 years or in 10 years, then <laughs> people will click on it, you know, but Yeah. It sh- it just goes to show me that humans are capable of so much like you're saying that you're having this thing fly because you're just utilizing the air and the charge that's in the air to power the plane. 
like that's incredible or the sun or batteries that are you know now getting small enough and efficient enough to where they can power a plane get people where they need to be yeah i honestly i think it's about perspective because i have some family members that it is kind of a doom and gloom time and for me i'm just like this is this is the time to be excited this is this year yeah we had a pandemic but it was also the first time in almost 10 years that we had americans in space on an american rocket yeah like that's that's history yeah and the world moves forward yeah there's so many other things that are happening right now and i just i see a lot of good happening like a lot of people are are realizing how important it is to you know be connected and to um, take care of each other and like yeah there's always the outlying people who don't want to take care of each other and be jerks and stuff like that but there's a lot of exciting things that are happening if you look for them. Yeah. I find the majority of people hate each other on Facebook, but are pretty good friends in real life. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like on Facebook, like you're an idiot, but in real life, you know, we'd get along really well. So yeah. I think it's just people are divided by the things that they hear, unfortunately. So Let's not be divided. Let's come together right now over me. <laughs> yeah. hmm. um, so now do you have any questions? So those are the only two concepts that I wanted to talk about before I move into like the companies that are working on electric planes and what they've accomplished and that kind of stuff. But like anything we've covered so far sounds all gravy. Sounds gravy to me, man. Yeah. I was just <laughs> curious about, who's working on it or how soon is this going to be out? I guess just any other information you have. So there's, there's a few companies. The first one I'll talk about is called Xenom Aero. Mm-hmm. And this is a company backed by Boeing and JetBlue. And right now they're just working on hybrid planes. Okay. And so for example, instead of um, on four engines on a big airline um, carrier, so four jet engines, one of them will be electric. Oh, cool. And so like it's progress, but you know, it's like a, I'm going to tiptoe into the future. <laughs> well, sometimes that might just be what it takes because you have to change public and political perspective over time. You can't just yeah. Like if I went back in time, like let's say I went back in time and I took with me my iPhone, you know, back 200 years or whatever. And I'd be like, you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world. People would be like, they, I don't think they would accept it, you know? Yes. But because but- things happen over time, maybe that makes them more acceptable to the public. I'm I'm going to raise a counter argument in that you know nothing nothing really happens in your comfort zone. And so I I think it's just a way for those big companies like Boeing and JetBlue to play it safe and And to, also for them to say hey look we're green. <laughs> yeah. We're green. Exactly. We're we're environmentally friendly. We're we're, uh, we're, we're the future. Yeah, we're not burning so much jet fuel but <laughs> Still 75% jet Just three-fourths of it. But also, if you think about some of the greatest leaps in technology, they were at times when we were pushing ourselves. So like the, um, the Manhattan Project, I just watched a documentary on it, and we were pushing our scientists and engineers. We are spending billions of dollars to develop this technology. And then once we did, the whole world changed. Yeah. Um, the same thing like with Tesla, they don't just, eh, let's kind of tiptoe into this electric car thing and only do one car at a time. No, they were developing a car at the same time as manufacturing two other cars. And then they just announced a fourth car or a fifth car truck that now they're going to start developing again alongside their fourth car. Like they don't, <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. something. Or And then even in the uh, 60s and 70s when we wanted to put a man on the moon, we were developing technology at a breakneck pace. Like We didn't know how to mathematically 
um, program computers to bring a guy back from space. And we were mm. inventing that as it was happening. And so, I don't know. I just I mean, feel it like was it was a race. It, it was, was a race. Literally a race. I just feel like that's when we do our best is when there's a deadline and when there's more benefits than just saving some money or being able to, you know, some PR move. Yeah. It's when your back's against the wall, right? Yes. Good way of saying that. And, you know, maybe that day will come where, hey, it's an energy crisis. We need to figure this out now, not in 50 years, but now that day may come. And I think that we're kind of like in a good position to step up to that because we've already got those concepts going. And now we just need to be like, bam, like, hey, guess what? Now you have no other option. No, so yeah, make that's, this happen. I totally agree. I feel like, you know, mankind is able to adapt really well when we need to. And we just got to be pushed a little bit. Because, yeah, I mean, the reason I said that about kind of working your way into it is because I thought, well, if you're comfortable being on a a three uh, a quarter electric plane or a half electric plane, then maybe that makes you more likely to be comfortable when all of a sudden it's fully electric and you don't even realize. You know what I yeah, mean? Like I could, the transition I could see that. where you're like, okay, well, I've already been riding on electric planes or a hybrid. And so an electric plane is like not that much of a step for you because you're like, yeah, I mean, we're already doing it. Yeah, I guess but, that makes sense. But like there's also not been a major reason to think electric planes are unsafe. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they're just not very wild, widely known and tested yeah. in the public yeah. eye, right? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So anyway, this company, Zenum, Zunum Aero, they're working on some hybrid planes that can carry anywhere from like 10 to 50 people. They're supposed to be launching a 12-seater hybrid plane this year, but because of you know, COVID. COVID, I don't think it's going to happen, but we'll see. I could be surprised. Um, another big airline um, called Airbus. It's not really in the United States, but it's mostly in Europe and um, outside of America. They are also working on a hyperplane, which is kind of the same as um, the Zunum Aero, where it's just one engine out of four is electric. Yeah. And they are also, they don't have a lot of plans or material out there for me to read, but they say they want to launch something this year. Like the program, I think. I don't think they're going to actually launch a plane. They could, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then this this company is kind of funny. It's um, it's the word hero, but instead of an O at the end of the word, it's a zero. Okay. And they are a company that it's just pure concept right now. They have a, a plane that they've designed around the electric drivetrain of batteries and electric motors and stuff like that. And it looks really cool. And on, I don't know how many people are calling it, but they're, they're calling this company the Tesla of, you know, aerospace. Huh. Airplane companies. Trying to out Tesla the Tesla, huh? Which is weird because I'm like, <laughs> the Tesla of aerospace is SpaceX. Right. So I'm like, uh, I don't know how far that's going to go. But they have a really cool, so normally planes, the way they work is they pull the air to generate thrust that pulls uh -huh. the air over the wing. What they're doing is they're pushing the air from behind the plane. Mm, so the plane whoa. looks like this big flying T huh. with um, propellers on the back of it, which is really cool. So oh, like wow. The, you know what that makes me think of is, uh, do you remember Boba Fett's ship? from star wars mm -hmm. that's basically i mean that's what it looks like right it's standing up like it's like you said it's like a giant t in the air i mean it's not a t but well the bottom of the t is what is facing forward and the flat top oh. part is the back and the propellers are on the top oh okay or yeah it's hard to describe i thought it was like the crossing of the t like was like the T was standing up in the air. 
Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, I need to describe my stuff better. <laughs> when you say it's a giant flying T. Yeah, so like the like, pointy, the pointy end way? of the T is going forward, like, like in the Tetris. direction of flight. Yeah. Okay. So the, the crossing of the T is in the back. Yes, and then it's okay. so like when you write a T on top of it would be the propellers, um, and they're and the propellers are facing backwards so they can um, push the air so that it can make the plane go forward. Cool. It also reminds me of I don't know if you've ever seen on YouTube. There's a like an Iron Man suit, but it's made out of like air. It just blows air out of the arms. Oh, really? <laughs> so this guy, he just puts both his arms back like behind him and it blows air so hard that he like he's literally flying around. Oh, really? That's cool. Um, is that the Gravity Company? I didn't. Oh, man, I mean, I, I just thought I think of it right now. Got, I don't know. He's got turbines on his arms. Because, yeah, see. I am. Um, I've been following it. So it's a UK based company and he's got a jet engine on his back and then two on each arm and he uses those. Oh dude, it's to, Adam Savage. He, so Adam Savage um, used it in his show. Um, okay. But the company that builds that is called gravity and the, okay. the founder is an engineer who put this together um, but yeah, Adam Savage, like he puts on Iron Man armor and like tries to fly around with this thing because he wants to see like be like Iron Man, which is <laughs> amazing. But yeah, those are tiny, tiny little jet engines. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, but if they're jet engines, because it looks like, so does it burn fuel? Yeah, yeah. So they, oh, I think crazy. it's only got like a, I don't know, like a 15 minute flight time. I don't know. Something like that. I feel like I'm not that comfortable carrying around jet fuel on my body, <laughs> like yeah, it's attached a to me. Thing. <laughs> if you ever see videos of Adam Savage learning how to do it, it is dicey. Oh, um, Colin Furs. <laughs> Colin Furs is another YouTube guy um, that he did it. He learned how and he picked it up really quickly. But um, he's got a good video of it on his channel. Um, Colin is C-O-L-I-N. And then his last name Furs F U R Z E. So check yeah. him out. He's insane. He makes so much cool stuff. I love that guy. Ah, uh, I would love to build stuff like that. That'd be so much fun. Just as your job, just build the funnest, craziest stuff ever. And like, I don't know, his his attitude and his mannerisms and his music to like just <laughs> they click with me and I just want to be like like his whole style. He's like wearing a tie, but it's like half off and it's like yeah, his safety he's got tie. Got his shirt untucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's crazy. So, um, yeah, those are some companies, and then um, the next three companies, these next ones, they're making some real good progress. I feel like the first one is called Amp Air. Uh huh. Um, so it's like, you know, the unit for current is ampere, and we just call it amps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this guy, it's a play on that name of the word because it's ampere is the name of the guy who kind of not created, but he kind of discovered the way to measure current, um, and right. which call it amps. But this guy, instead of spelling it A M P H E R E, like the person, he uh -huh. spells it A M P A I R E. Oh, cool. Um, so these guys are really cool. They're, um, do you know, uh, the Cessna level size planes? No. So those those planes are like the Bush pilots, the ones you see that have like three or four seats, and they okay. are the ones that like kind of like the one that Indiana Jones flies in a lot. The smaller right, right, right. planes. Um, they converted one of those, and they call it the electric eel. <laughs> and um, it only has two engines, and they converted one of the engines to uh, run on electricity. Like they have it, its own um, powertrain. One of the engines. Oh, cool. So they, they've been doing some really good flights and because it's a old Cessna um, type plane, the certification process is a lot easier. And so they've been yeah. making a lot of good um, headway. 
And then the next there, so this is in Canada. It's two companies. They partnered up. It's called Harbor Air and Magni X. They have uh-huh. a fleet of seaplanes. So like planes that just um, like fly over the ocean. I don't know how to describe it. Transcontinental. I don't know. Well, I mean, they're not like big planes. So like, it's like for going from island to island. Oh, yeah. But you can land those, on the ocean. Uh, pond jumpers or something. Yeah, something like that. But um, these guys, they wanted to um, retrofit all of their Cessna, all of their electric, pl- all of their, sorry, not electric, all of their planes to be electric. Um, and their first plane that they retrofitted and got certified and had an actual flight, um, it was only a 15-minute flight. <laughs> but... <laughs> the, it was a success, it was a successful flight and um they're going to start converting a lot of their their planes over cuz i guess a lot of their flights aren't that long yeah um so and the technology's only gotten better yeah i feel like that's like when you get a you buy this drone and it's really cool and then you're like how long can i fly it 6 minutes wow <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's incredible. See, that was my biggest letdown when, um, you know, those tiny little um, drones that have the camera on them? Yeah. My brother got one for Christmas and I was playing with it because you can hook it up to your phone and have like a VR, not VR, but like a first person view of your flight. Uh Uh-huh. And I was flying it and getting used to it and it died after like like six or seven minutes. I was like, I barely got the hang of the controls in that time and it charged for like, two hour, hours two three hours. hours yeah it was crazy um but anyway it's a, um it's funny when i was researching this company um the harbor air magni x they just came out with a new plane called e caravan and it completed a 30 minute flight and the size of the plane was a nine passen- nine passengers could fit on this plane okay so not bad and so you were talking earlier about how because they're regional flights and because you're not using this expensive jet fuel, it'll be less expensive to fly. Yeah. Um, these guys actually did some number crunching on what the difference is for fuel costs. And so for that 30 minute flight with nine passengers, it will cost $6 in electricity. Okay. If you were to for use a- traditional jet fuel, it's $300. Ooh. Crazy. For a 30 minute flight? Oh my gosh. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And so if we start having flights from Phoenix to LA, Los Angeles, or Salt Lake, like it could cost you like 15 bucks to reserve your seat. Yeah, because the cheaper it is for them, the cheaper it is for you. So mm-hmm. if it's Hopefully. costing them let's say it's a lot of people or it's a bigger plane, so it's a hundred bucks in electricity or something still that cost is covered so quickly if you have 50 even 50 people you know on your plane Mm -hmm. so that's that's the dream right there man flying is way too expensive it's ridiculous right now yeah i mean even right now it's cheaper because of covid but it's still like uh, do i really want to so the there's another fact from the business insider article that was kind of talking about this so there are hundreds and hundreds of airports in America. Yeah. And right now we're only utilizing two and a half percent of them. Really? If, or if like I, two and a half capacity yet, or two and a half of the airports. So they're, they're not like using all of their, like there are a lot of, uh, how do I say this? Regional airports we don't use them very much anymore. Right. Because we're using just the huge airport. Yeah. The bigger planes, we can't, you know, we can't possibly land them in these smaller like uh, airports. And so what they're doing is instead of using these regional airports, so like we have an airport in Mesa, the only way that that Mesa airport can stay functioning is by partnering with ASU and community colleges to train pilots, to train technicians and, and people like that. So that like it doesn't run at a loss. 
because only right. smaller airlines can run out of those. Yeah, and it's way less common. But it 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 could be better. You know what I mean? Like oh, absolutely. Um, if we were able to run out of all of the regional airports, there wouldn't be any weight. Like I don't know if you've flown out of Mesa. Oh, but there's oh hardly any weight or it's so much better. The, the, the process of walking in the door of the airport and getting on the plane is significantly shorter and less like crazy. I don't, not crazy. I don't know I mean, if it's, I don't know if this is a good thing, but I feel like the security there just kind of looks at you and they're like, go ahead. Like they don't really, they're not quite as strict as that Phoenix gateway or at uh sky Harbor. They're just kind of like, Hey, you look all right. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just found it. So there are 20,000 FAA-approved runways in the U.S., and only 2.5% are currently active. Meaning, like 20,000? The, there are 20,000 runways. Wow. And only 2.5% are active because they're the big air, airplanes like the Phoenix Sky Harbor <laughs> yeah. and the Los Angeles LAX and Seattle and oh, Chicago. Man. If and you've so, been to some of those, you know what a nightmare they are. Yeah. And so it's it's crazy of like, yeah, we need those airports, but we could be utilizing other air, regional ones. smaller ones for these mm-hmm. electric planes that are only going regionally. And I'll bet you that like seven or eight times out of 10, you're not flying far enough. You're like, you're doing a regional flight. Like when I fly places... I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably going to LA or I'm probably going to Texas or I'm probably going to, you know, somewhere really close. Yeah. Like I I said in the beginning of this, that over, um, it says a little less than half of all flights in the world were regional flights. They were under 500 miles. Right. And so it's like the, the amount of people going to these large airports would be drastically reduced. And it like, yeah, yeah it, would, it would hurt a little bit, but we could put electric planes there. We could put electric planes. So we have, I think three runways other than sky Harbor in the like Phoenix area. There's one in Mesa, one in Scottsdale and one in um, West Phoenix. Yeah. And so it's like those three airports could get you to Los Angeles, Salt Lake and um, uh, Las Vegas. Super easy. Yo. So, yeah, that sounds like a great way to get the airports decongested and wait times cut way down, less flight cancellations, less delays. Yeah, I'll have to go in on a different episode, but there was an idea in the 80s about creating circular runways. Hmm. And That's uh, interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to go into that because it's, it's kind of talking about these problems of like noise and long runways and weather conditions and things like that and making them circular and sloped like a like a racetrack like nascar they have the road isn't flat it's kind of um, Uh uh-huh slanted or can't canted i think is the word but yeah that's interesting i don't know it's it's a cool i'm excited about landing on something like that but i'm sure well it would make it easier because there's no there wouldn't be as much wind true true so anyway different different day yeah. Um, and so the last company is probably my favorite. Um, it's called Eviation. So instead of aviation, they put an E in front of the Viation. Yep. And they've done something similar to um, one of the other companies where it's just a pure, we've redesigned the entire plane from the ground up around batteries and electric uh, propulsion. Um and it's, it's got a lot of traction and they're in the process. They built the plane and they're in the process of um, certifying it with the, the FAA. So it's like they're very shortly here. They're going to be doing um, passenger flights. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, even just right there, the number of companies that you were able to find, this is, this is the next big thing. I mean, as in it's going to become part of our lives, you know, it's going to become a lot more common. You're going to see a bunch of those companies coming up. Actually, I would love to get some of those companies to see if I can invest in them. Yeah, I can't wait for some of these guys to, you know, uh, offer some Catch stock. Up. Yeah, I mean, even if they don't get huge, but if it's the next, you know, right Tesla. now there's, yeah. 
well even even if it doesn't get that big but but uh yeah that's awesome i feel like electricity is the way of the future well if you think about it there there are more places to get electricity than there are places you can get gas yeah like if it really came down to it you could make electricity by yourself in your house right now you have the power but you you don't have the capacity to make gasoline from scratch says you (laughs) (laughs) you should see my garage (laughs) you're a secret chemist Uh, i don't have a garage yet yet (laughs) but yeah so yeah yeah, that's that's all i've got for electric planes um i hope it was you know insightful and people can kind of understand that this is something that's going to be a part of our lives hopefully very soon yeah i never thought about it that way kind of you know what we got into about all the pros that go into that and not a lot of cons that i can see so that's pretty awesome i feel like uh when you can get get a win-win-win situation you know that's that's a good engineering plan so yeah and right now honestly i think it's just manpower nope not a lot of people know about it. Not a lot of people are working on it and you know, mm-hmm. it's going to be cheaper air travel. It's going to be more efficient than gas. It's going to be like, it's going to be easier to produce because the complexity of the plane is going to go down. So it's like, it, it is truly a win, win, win. We just, there are a few hurdles right at the beginning that we have to overcome before it explodes. Yeah. Not literally, but like in <laughs> popularity. Yeah, we don't want it to explode. <laughs> yeah. Well, it shouldn't explode. There's not a lot of gasoline on there. So it shouldn't be as bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, man. Thanks for sharing that. And, uh, oh, before we go, let's give our recs. Um, well, I know this doesn't have anything to do with engineering, but, man, you know I love good podcasts. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... There is a podcast pretty recently just came out. It's called An Oral History of the Office. And it is entirely hosted by Brian Baumgartner, who played Kevin on The Office. So Brian goes through basically just he, I mean, it is what it says it is. It's an oral history of The Office. So he starts from the very foundation of how the show got started. He interviews, you know, every single person that was on the office, Steve Carell. Mm -hmm. um, And uh, it's really cool. So check it out. Check that out. It's classy. It's fun to listen to. Great way to just stay entertained while you're working away. So that's my rec. Nice. Um, So mine is just because it came came up in my research for this episode. Um, There's a engine an engineer in Scotland. He has a YouTube channel and a bunch of TV shows. Um, the channel is called real engineering. Um, and he actually has specific episodes on electric planes and ion propulsion planes. And so, you know, obviously I didn't do a super great job of describing those um, topics. So go and see a professional do it with nice, you know, he explains the equations and he shows you how lift is generated and good graphics and, he does a really, really great job at explaining complex engineering um, ideas and concepts. So that would be my my recommendation. Yeah, I'm looking at his videos. They look awesome. They look really like well laid out, really easy to understand. So yeah, check yeah. that out. Real engineering. Yeah. So um, that's all. That's all we've got for this week. All right, guys. Till the next one, take it easy and we'll, we'll catch you on the next one.